Blank check with Griffin and David. Blank check with Griffin and David. Don't know what to say or to expect. All you need to know is that the name of the show is Blank Check. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the podcast! <laughs> um, hello everybody, this is Blank Check with Griffin and David. My name is Griffin Newman. My name is uh, David Sims. That is, you had to check there for a second. You seem to hesitate. I, well, you know, you know, this is a weird one, so I just have to make sure nothing had changed about me. Oh, this one's a little bit spooky, if you will. <laughs> Ooh. Um, this is a, a Thursday bonus, if you will. Um, <laughs> yes, I will. One, one of these little minis that we throw out there to finish up our thoughts on a filmmaker at the end of a mini series, And this one is, is in a way... Perhaps the start of a new little secret miniseries, right? Yes. Because uh, we're talking about one segment from an anthology film, but it remains incredibly likely that we will cover two of the other filmmakers behind yep. two of the other segments yep. in this anthology movie at some point in the future, at which point we will discuss those segments. And then there is a fourth director that we will uh, never discuss on this podcast. <laughs> We never will. We have to commit to that, right? Even we though he to. has made mm, arguably five incredible films. Yep. Uh, maybe six. I maybe. look. I mm. I've thought about it. I mean, the guy has made at least. I think he's made four masterpieces and uh -huh. two other great movies, and the Thriller music video, which is probably the most famous music video of all time. So, like, right? But let's talk about that. His most famous music video of all time. Problematic. His son. Problematic. Wait, wait, is something up? Wait, wait, wait. Is something up with Michael Jackson? We can, we don't have time for this. <laughs> wait, you just said we don't have time for something. Yes. The Twilight Zone. <laughs> we are truly within it. We're in the zone, baby. Auto zone. <laughs> Yes, we don't really want to talk about John Landis, but we no. certainly will talk about Joe Dante one day. We certainly yes. will talk about the uh, pre early nineteen ninety three Spielberg. Yeah, yeah. Spielberg, and yeah. we have been talking about George Miller. Yes, um, and so today we are talking about his segment in this film, which is considered to be the best segment. I think pretty undisputed, the best segment uh, the film of this film. The film is, of course, Twilight Zone, the movie from 1983. I guess in Miller's career, does it, it comes between Mad Max's... Uh, no, it comes after Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome before... Yes. No, 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 no. No? No, sorry. It's between Mad Max's two and three. That's crazy. It is crazy. I made the same assumption. I wasn't looking up the years, but I made the same assumption that it was between uh, uh, Thunderdome and Witches of Eastwick. Like when here, like I'll just to the other people who contributed to this movie. Okay, so with mm -hmm. Landis, mm -hmm. it's this is coming in between Trading Places and like you know Spies Like Us. So like he is, sure. he's a big deal. Spielberg, mm -hmm. obviously, this is coming in between. Well, Jesus, let me. Uh, it's in between E. T. and Temple of Doom. Woo! <laughs> he's doing all right. He's yeah. doing all right. Yeah. And then Dante is coming in between The Howling and Gremlins. So I guess Dante and Miller are the slightly younger, more yes. up-and-coming directors, right? Yes. I'm going to read to you uh, Roger Ebert's uh, quote from the review of this. Did you say what this was between for Landis? I know we're not talking about him, but out of curiosity. Uh, yeah, I said, uh, geez, I already forgot, but it's in between. Um, he had just made, twi I believe Trading Places came out the same year. Yes, okay. had, that had just come out. And the ne in 85, he has both Into the Night and Spies Like Us. So okay. he's a little okay. bit on the downslope. But, I mean, Trading Places is huge, and then he does two more Eddie Murphy movies after this. I mean, he's sort yes. of in a transition point to switching from those first wave SNL guys and being their director to now being Eddie Murphy's director. Right. And of course, yeah, he still has like three amigos and right, as you say, coming into America on the horizon. But I do feel like Trading Places is Landis's peak. So 
right? He's just maybe just about because he's behind him is like Animal House, Blues Brothers, American Werewolf, like the, the you know his yeah. his most influential. Hey, but look, once again, we're not talking about him. Uh, this is what <laughs> no. Roger Ebert said because this film, Landis and Spielberg get producer credits. This was very much uh, hatched by them. Those two guys were in the pocket. They were in the zeitgeist. Uh, Spielberg could not have been bigger. And um, they both grew up with this TV show, so they totally. had a lot of love for it. Yeah. Right, and you have, like, Spielberg works with Lucas. Lucas works with Coppola. It's like, in a certain degree, this was the the movie brats, the serious movie brats, allowing yep. Landis into their sphere as, like, you're now part of the system. We all help each other. We make our passion projects together. And then he is promptly pushed out uh, during this when he commits involuntary manslaughter. So, uh, yes, when there is a horrifying uh, accident on the set of his uh, his segment time. We're not talking uh, about it. That we're not going to talk we're about We're never going to talk about it on this podcast. It's horrible. It's one of the worst things that has ever happened in relation to the movie industry. And I that don't say accurate. that lightly. Yeah. Um, even worse than X-Men Origins Wolverine. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So this is Ebert's quote from the review of the film. He said, the surprising thing is the two superstar directors are thoroughly routed by two less known directors who pre- whose previous credits have been horror and action pictures. Spielberg, who produced the whole project, right. perhaps sensed that he and Landis had the weakest results since he assembles the story in an ascending order of excitement. Right. Ebert reviewed the movie in like he chopped it into segments and he gave two stars for the prologue and first mm-hmm. segment, which is yeah. Landis's is the first. Correct. Right. Yes. Right. And then he he gave um, Spielberg segment one and a half stars, which is, I feel like, widely regarded as the worst. You have contended and, it is not only the worst segment of this film, but the worst thing Spielberg worst has film. ever directed. And there's a really it's good argument there. Yeah. Uh, and then three and a half stars for the third, the one we're going to discuss tonight. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And then no, fourth, and the fourth, no, the fourth, the fourth. This oh, ends three and a half the stars film. for the Dante and then three and a half stars also for this one. The, the Miller. Right. Right. And I would say maybe this Miller deserves four. It's um, it's pretty inarguable. Yeah, like the, the, it's it's just twenty minutes of of it's great. It rules. It, and, and twenty minutes of just sheer bravura filmmaking yeah. above all. It else. fucking rules. Yeah, it's and so. Have good. you? Okay. So we, I only watched it because I wanted to respect our whole experiment. Yep. Of of just you know we'll talk about the other ones whenever we talk about the other ones, right? Sure. Yeah. So I just, I queued up Twilight Zone, the movie. I skipped to like, you know, one hour, 25 minutes or whenever mm-hmm. this began. And I just watched Nightmare at 20,000 Feet. Now, have you seen the original Nightmare at 20,000 Feet? The uh, uh, William Shatner Many times. One? Many times yeah. and many times uh, in the recent past. Um, I, I in love. In the recent past? Like you watch in... it a lot? Yeah, I watch it a lot. I love Twilight Zone. I watch it a lot. I had never really watched it outside of like you know you're a kid an occasional episode comes on on like a a weekend afternoon or whatever um but about five years ago it all went up on netflix and i started watching it a lot um and my goal was to get through all of them there are a lot uh of them many seasons and they're long uh the seasons um but i've never made it all the way through to the end Uh, a because there's one season that's bad which is the season where they're hour long episodes I uh-huh. think it's the second to last season. Uh, also because I get caught up wanting to rewatch some of them a lot. And uh, the two Shatner episodes, uh, Nightmare, and then the other one is, uh, I'm forgetting the name, but it's the one with the fortune teller in the diner, are two of the best episodes. I think they're both Richard Matheson episodes. I've probably I, seen each of those Nick five of time, times. Nick I of Time, I believe, is the name of the, yeah, the other one. Yeah. Um, I've seen both of those at least five times. Um, I love uh-huh. them. Uh, so yeah, I, I was I was I had a very strong comparison point watching this, and I all much like you, I only watched this segment. Although mm-hmm. I also watched the prologue and the epilogue because the uh-huh. epilogue ties mm-hmm. into this segment, and the prologue sets up the epilogue. Uh huh. Right. Uh, the prologue and epilogue were directed by Landis. Landis, right? unfortunately, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Look, the man made a lot of good movies. Look, it's it's he okay did. to you know denounce his nightmarish uh, like uh, record as a person and mm-hmm. acknowledge <laughs> that yes, obviously he was involved in some good projects. Yes, uh, he was. Um, yeah, but but have you not seen the original? No, I have. I have. I've seen it, but only once and okay. years ago. 
And I've never, I have never done the Twilight Zone properly, which is, you know, I guess a bit of a gap in my pop culture sort of, you know, I've seen random episodes like, you know, you mentioned like they might pop up on TV. I feel like I sought this one out because one, I'm scared of flying. Mm. Two, I love Star Trek. Mm. Um, And three, it's famous. And like, there's a Simpsons parody of it. Yes. So like, I feel like this one was on my radar early. Yeah. And I watched it and it's great, but obviously it is a TV episode and the the demon is like a guy in a big fursuit and it's, you know, it's a different vibe than than the sort of high octane vibe of the Miller movie. Yeah, I think I, I mean the single biggest difference aside from the fact that uh Lithgow versus Shatner really changes the tone of the thing. Um, but the characters are also conceived differently. Um, the single biggest difference is that the original is very talky. Uh, like a lot right. of Twilight Zones, it's like a, a fiction short story that was then right. adapted into something that in many ways resembles a teleplay over yeah, the, the Twilight a film. Zones, I think of them as talky. They're right. usually, and I right, love them. Know. They're also very yeah. cinematically stylish. I mean, there's a lot right. of really interesting directing going on in those, and they're all directed by different people. Um, the, the, the original directed by Richard Donner, correct? Yes, yes. yes. I mean, w- yeah. one of his breakthroughs. But yeah. um, it is very talky. It is uh, uh, Shatner's character on the plane with his wife, I believe. He has a wife. And isn't it also that he's like just out of a sanitarium, so correct. he's like... Everyone assumes he's crazy because he's right, but it's like you're finally ready to deal with this again. Remember the last time you were on a plane, you freaked right. out, right? right, right um, right. but there's a lot of that, there's a lot of explained backstory. The whole thing is him having co- the conversation with his wife, right? Um, this one very much exists in this guy's head, and there's very little dialogue overall. And he probably yeah. has the least dialogue of any primary character, right. he mostly segment. is just groaning and yelling, right? So, this really is kind of just like a director showcase and an actor showcase. It rules. It rules. And I do it love fucking that. It, we, we, rules. It like there's no exposition really. We don't no. start with like the plane taking off. We don't start with him taking his seat. We start no. like in the middle of an insane thunderstorm. The plane is just like rattling right. around. Yeah. Right. And he is just like basically ninety nine percent of his way to losing his mind. Which I don't say this is any criticism of the original. It's just an interesting counterpoint. The original is great for what it is. This is great for what it is. Oh yeah. But, but do something different, especially if you're going to. Totally. This is the only one in, that is a direct remake, right? right. Um, the other ones, the Dante no, one's a remake remakes, as well, right. but it's a looser remake. Right. The Spielberg, no, you're right. You're right. The the um the, the other two one's are a remake. Kick the the other two are remake. looser remakes. Uh, the Landis right. one is kind of a combination of two unofficially. Right. 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 But it's the most original one of them. Um, no, this is right. the they're... most direct adaptation, I will say, even though it takes so many chances and changes because it's still the same it's a basics. chamber piece and it's the yeah. same basic i mean and the it has thing the is the same so ending simple. you know twilight um, zone yes right yeah. like twilight yes, zone obviously the ending matters a lot and this has basically the ending where they're like With variation oh, right, he was right. right right um as the guy gets carted away they realize he was right spoilers right. um but but yes as i was gonna say and it's like you know they're both elegant in their different ways but the shatner one starts with as we were alluding to like him and his wife explaining every element of their backstory elegantly in a, in a sort of classical way, but just like, honey, this isn't going to be like last time you spent that time in the sanatorium. You've gotten fixed this time. You're going to be able to fly without freaking out. Like it's that. And Shatner is very Shatnery. He's in that pre uh, Kirk mode where he is perfecting how to be a TV leading man. Um, And so everything is very like, you know, that's his um, thing. Totally. And so right. he's playing a very different type of mania. It is a very controlled, uh, a very sort of um, expressionistic mania that does not resemble actual human behavior. Whereas uh, Lithgow is very theatrical, but I do feel like this performance and this short film uh, really capture the feeling of having a panic attack. I don't know if you as someone who's particularly terrified by planes feel that. Um, well, I will say, as someone who's afraid of flying in a plane, mm-hmm. 
um, whenever I'm on a plane because I know how I feel. It's this part of the panic is just this balance between like being afraid and not wanting to be too publicly afraid because then you're going to like everyone's going to be paying attention to you. There's that is, that that is like, what Shatner is playing. Right, and I right. think Shatner I does this it. Down. Yes. Right. Shatner does it very cannily. It's a v- they're asking a very different thing of him. And that right. is it's all about he is more of a conventional protagonist. And you're trying to see if this guy can play calm enough to right. be able to stop and, the problem without someone stopping him. Right. And he's also just out of his sanitarium. So he's like, you know, doesn't want to go back in. Like, he's, And he's right, learned he's, coping he's, skills, right. all this sort of stuff. Right. But it's him being like, this is a real threat. No one else recognizes it. No one else believes me. It's a boy who cried wolf situation. Right. And it's the tension comes from how do you solve that? This is just a man losing it. Right. The the premise, by the way, just in case anyone doesn't know, is that, right, they're in a plane, it's in a storm, things are bad, he's having a panic attack, and then as he looks out the window, he sees a big monster on the wing just wailing on the engines, just terror. I feel like also in the Shatner one, the monster is more, like, mischievous, but isn't exactly, like, antagonistic. Like, it's more just sort of messing with things, whereas this, it's like a demon that's like, I am yeah. trying to bring this plane down. Like, I am, yeah. this is happening. And the original is basically in, like, a one of those camouflage, like, bush costumes, and he's, like, dancing yes, on the wing. Of. Whereas in this well, one, it looks yeah. like a meatloaf album cover. You guys yes. know, you know what this creature is supposed to be in both of these versions. Uh, go ahead. It's supposed to be a gremlin. Yeah, gremlin. Yeah, that's what right. I think of it as. as but the, the classical gremlin, right. gremlin yeah. the sort of uh, urban legend of uh, the American fighter pilot. Yes. That something if something went wrong engine, in your plane, right, yeah. something went wrong in your engine, there's a little gremlin who's attacking your plane. Uh, Except just, it's a pretty big Brett gremlin. This is a big boy. Well, this is my point. In the original, yeah. it's huge. It's a, it's a full-sized it's a human man. being in a puffy right. suit with puffy hair and funny makeup. And in this, it's a large gremlin, but it's also like a puppet, and it doesn't have human proportions. No. As, as Ange said, it's, it's right. It's a bat out of hell. It looks like a really large lemur. <laughs> and he's kind I of love. got some like predator hair going yes. on. Yeah. He's got some predator dreads. I just yeah. find it particularly funny because the year after this is uh, Gremlins, produced by mm-hmm. Spielberg, directed by Joe Dante. Sure. And they, they're, they're those gremlins. They're, they're little fellas. Yes, but now when people, hand. when people hear, well, no, they're not that tiny. Please, David. Well, Mogwai okay. could fit in your hand. Yeah. Okay, David, shut the fuck up and show some respect. Okay. <laughs> okay. There's a I difference. Could fit in two hands. Yeah, gremlins. I'd say are probably uh, knee to waist high terrors. Sure. Right. Yeah. And not waist high. Knee. Yeah, knee ankle high. to knee. <laughs> they're, they're not too small. We Look, should do Dante. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Wait a second. David, you think we should do Dante? <laughs> oh, my God. What a radical idea. I, I should give you, you a medal for being such a forward thinker. All right. Doing Dante, I've never considered. All right. Um, You're going to have to work hard to sell me, though, David. Oh, now boy. Listen. You're going to have to butter me up on the idea of Joe Dante. I thought the <sighs> cartoons in the Anthony sketch were, reminded me a lot more of Gremlins. But yeah, that is a Dante segment. Sure, sure. Uh, yes, it is It is just funny to me. Yes, it, 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 of course that resembles Gremlins the movie more uh, right. because uh, Dante was in that headspace. It's his style and whatever. I just find it funny that this guy makes a Gremlins movie and the next year Spielberg's like, hey, you, the guy who made the segment before this, make a Gremlins movie. And not only that... But that becomes the association in the public when you say the word gremlins. Like yes. gremlins stop right. being That's what a, gremlin is. Right. a thing right. on a plane. Which there's also in the 50s, uh, it's like the great unmade Walt Disney animated film. Do you know about this? Uh, no. Walt Disney and Roald Dahl were going to make an animated film called Gremlins about gremlins uh, on Roald planes. Roald Dahl famously flew planes in the war as well. The famous anti-Semite, famously flew planes. Famous um, slut. Yeah. Famous slut. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. He was horny AF. Yeah. On Maine, too. Horny. He was occasionally <laughs> horny, horny on, on the Maine. Maine Roll Dahl. Yeah. <laughs> People forget this, but, like, if you read SEO Trot, the Roll Dahl book, like, page The turtle four- one? Yes. Page okay. 45 is just uh, uh, a bunch of nudes. He would just slip nudes 
into onto, onto turtles backs and then they would crawl over to the neighbor's house is that the turtle one yes yes yeah correct. SEO yes. i think it just like passes yeah. messages no i double checked yes correct it's it's m- corresponding through turtle anyway my joke is that we're all doll put nudes inside the book yes <laughs> right i forgot about this though. i'm just seeing the book i have heard of this that there's there is a book of it like um that he wrote for walt disney see when i yeah. think gremlins i think looney tunes hardback. Well, so yes, and then and then Looney Tunes run with it, but it's like there's the the book that never becomes a film. That's Roald mm-hmm. Dahl and Disney. I think the book came out either instead of the film, or they released it because they thought it would lead to the film later. Then there's Looney Tunes Gremlins. Then there's Twilight Zone Gremlins, and then there's Joe Dante Gremlins. And Joe Dante Gremlins become so big that they usurp all public consciousness of Gremlins. Sure. They but just the idea become is, gremlins TM. Right. That's why gremlins are mischievous. It was like working off the idea of like these things that fuck with technology and fuck with us just to drive us crazy. Um, and in this, it's like, yeah, it's it's back to this idea of like, you don't have fighter pilots, you have commercial flight, which I think is pretty clever. Yeah. Like if gremlins mm-hmm. exist to fuck with planes, then they would be a threat to any any flight we any took. Any jumbo jet. Yeah. Um, but this thing starts with, as you said, no backstory, just Mm-mm. John Lithgow having a panic attack in a bathroom, yep. losing his fucking mind. And the they attendants are trying to do the whole like, hey, like, I know it's scary. We're shaking around, but like, you're safer up here than you are down there. You know, they're Throwing giving him the statistics. whole spiel. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and they're uh, trying to get him to take, uh, you know, a sedative. Right. The woman comes up to the flight attendants and is like, is there something I should be worried about? Is there a problem? It's such a perfect little moment of that flight thing. Where a certain mm-hmm. person thinks like I should go up and ask the flight attendants if there's something bad going on that they're not telling all of us. They'll tell oh, me. Man. It's all I think about. <laughs> right. Anytime I just want to go up to them and be like, so like, you know, what's come on, what have you heard? Like give me the real scoop. Yeah, <laughs> give yeah, me yeah. the deets. Yeah. But and I remember to- once being on a plane and the turbulent like suddenly turbulence was really bad. And I was next to, I was very close to a flight attendant station or whatever. And he picked up the phone, put it back down. And then he looked at his coworker and he was like, 10 minutes of this. And uh, so I was like, damn, like the pilot can literally be like, yeah, it's going to be this for 10 minutes. Wow. So do you like that, David? Do you like having that knowledge or did that freak you out more? Yeah, I mean, I didn't love at the time knowing that it was going to last for a (laughs) while. But yes, no, I I liked the weird precision of the pilot being like, not being like, oh no, but being like, annoying like you know like right. the, that's all it is right just like another day well because you said you watch like videos like simulations of oh flying, no, no, right? no 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 not simulations my friend i watch there's so many videos <laughs> inside the cockpit of a jumbo jet mm-hmm. where it's just like you know 777 taking off at san francisco and you can just watch the entire process or like 777 landing at Sarah. you know you could just and it's just them sitting there being like so boring and just like occasionally touching a button or saying right. something and you're like god it's so automatic and so chill that's like a lo-fi relaxing. playlist for you is like what you put on to like yeah. calm you down right. yeah I-, I can't believe it took me so long to come to this realization of course you love sully yeah. yeah, dude. He does have we not his talked job. About this? <laughs> no, I mean, I obviously, of course, you love Sully because you're a big special boy and you're smart and you have good opinions. And Sully's an American masterpiece. Correct. But, yes. But also, it's the ultimate competent man movie. In the yes. situation that scares you the most, he remains calm. Yes. He understands exactly how to solve it. It's basically the word, as Sully tells us. No yeah. one could have predicted it. No one could predict it. And, much like, and like, much like Donald Trump told us, no one could have predicted it. Uh, this isn't like that. Sully's so not lying when he says it. Um, right. Two great Americans never not compare lying. those two. It's why I love it because it's such a risky movie for me to watch because it's, yeah. you know, uh, up against I my I mean, the opening fear. is terrifying. Sure terrifying and like so when i saw it i think i saw it also because it was an eastwood movie i just figured it would be chill and it's yeah. not <laughs> no and no and and like so i'm gripping the seats but also as you say right it is a masterpiece of professionalism right so you watching sully feel like john lithgow in this plane um yes uh anyway but yeah but obviously this plane not doing so hot uh, although i n- still like it when the pilot comes out and he's like look we lost one engine Fine, i'll admit it <laughs> One engine yeah. is down. We yeah, have he's four. pretty chill about that. Can we talk a little Lithgow here? Can we go go Lithgow for a, a little moment? Lithgow? Touch the two chill. Oh little yeah, Lithgow? go go gadget Lithgow. Yeah. This is when he's in that classic, in that De Palma zone, right? Like, well, no, this is sort of the start of it. I thought he was in the Twilight go, Zone. 
Well, well, well and it. correct. Mm, good point. Correct. You go like 1979, all that jazz. That's his first big movie, small part, but his first big film in which he has a part of some substance, right? No, no. His first film is obsess- is the De Palma film. Oh, obsession. I'm sorry. He's yes, like the third. Correct. He's the villain correct. in that. Correct. He's a classic De Palma villain. He plays a lot of 1976, right. Obsession. But you're right. Fix, and then all that jazz, kids, bit all of a that breakout. Jazz. 81, blowout. Yeah, which he's the villain in, and he's great. Then 82, World According to Garp. I'm skipping over which ones he, I haven't heard of. Uh, yeah, but uh, World, he gets an Oscar nomination. Correct. Right? Yeah. And then 83, same year as this movie, Terms of Endearment, second okay. Oscar nomination. Right. And that, and he's only two Oscar noms. He's yeah. never gotten another one. It's pretty crazy for him to get them in back-to-back years, especially for Terms, which we talked about in that episode, is such an understated performance. Never Very gets it Very good performance. Again. Right. But, but, then, yeah, but it, it was surprising he beat out Jeff Daniels that year. Totally. For that. Yeah. And then this unlocks Gonzo Lithgow, which like yes. De Palma had started to play with. But De Palma really plays with it later raising with like Raising Cain, Cain exactly. things like that. Yeah, you know, but like yeah. this, he's got this this year. The following year, he's got Footloose, which is right. villain, the... but reserved villain. But right. then Buckaroo Banzai, which is complete fucking wackadoo, Insane villain. Right. crazy potato pants, right? And then yes. you get like shit like uh, he turns down Back to the Future to play Doc Brown was the first choice. Huh. Yeah, I think I knew that, but that's yeah, that's a totally different movie. Turns down the Joker for Burton. <laughs> totally different movie. Yeah, like to a certain degree, he now tries to resist the wackadoo thing that he had showed yeah. everyone he can do so well. 2010, Santa Claus the movie, and then he's starting to go into like Harry and the Hendersons, like family, like I'm boring waspy guy zone. That's the thing. He got shoved into that zone, into the yeah. sort of fuddy duddy zone. Right, and then he, which it is takes what a- third. No, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, it's Third Rock from the Sun is playing off of the Fuddy Duddy, but it's a wackadoo it's com- inside it's the Fuddy Duddy. combining them, right, exactly, right. which is which was sort of what was great. <laughs> is Third Rock from the Sun good, though? Yes, yes, yes. Is it? it? Yes, it is. It's yes, one of those shows that was on a lot, I've, on for years, mm-hmm. and I certainly watched it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, like, is it good? I think it is. I haven't rewatched it. It is probably pretty, cl- like, depending on how long... Uh, uh, COVID quarantine lasts I will watch all of Third Rock from the Sun I, I just bought fucking news radio on DVD I will well, find gotta, a way news radio you gotta buy because that one's always yeah. been weird it, always weird there are like four uh, random episodes on Crackle but news radio is like a masterpiece of yes. 90s sitcom right and yeah. I just remember as a kid being like as a kid who likes science fiction I'm like this sitcom is about aliens and I feel like no one talks about it Ever. Third Rock from the Sun's about shit. aliens? Yes. They're aliens. They're I don't aliens. remember this at all. I watched it yeah. as a kid, like with they're, my parents. They're alien and human bodies. The oldest of them gets stuck in Joseph Gordon Levitt, who is the youngest. Yes. The most masculine of them gets stuck in Kristen Johnson, who is the one woman yes. of the group. Like it's all like, oh look, they're, they're all, all in the wrong body. Weird, right. Yeah, yeah. They live in a house together. It's called Third Rock from the Sun because that's what they view Earth as. Yeah. Right. And they're trying wow, to assimilate yeah. into culture. I haven't yeah. thought about this show in years. Like, I vaguely remember the intro, but honestly, in my head, I'm like, yeah, this and Frasier are like the exact same thing. There was that crazy run where Wayne Knight was on both shows at the same time. At the same yeah. time. And, yeah. and like, and it, it just, I remember a show that was like kind of raunchy. It was mm-hmm. weirdly like world building. Like it had yes. like the, the big giant head, like it had a lot of yeah. stuff going on. Yeah. Um, but also at the same time, it also was in the vibe of every other 90s sitcom where it's like, you know, at the end of the day, it's mostly just hijinks, you know. A, was a, Shatner in a, the big giant head or I missed? Yeah, man. Yeah. So that's crazy. So it's the two yeah. versions of this character. All comes around. What's wild is he swings back to Fuddy Duddy, right? And then it seems like he goes like, fuck, I might have backed out on that villain thing too soon. So then he does like Ricochet, Raising Kane, Cliffhanger. Like then he gets back into it, but he's playing a little more like Tony villain. And then Raising Kane is weird uh, because he's doing wackadoo, but he's also the lead. Yes. And then I feel like at a certain point it was just too late and it's like, too bad, buddy. Now you're the old guy. Right, like and then post Third Rock, it's like you're just the old guy. Well, you guys forgot his most famous villain, Which Lord Farquaad. Well, well, mm, well, he's pretty good. Well, 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 yes, he's a real Farquaad in that movie. I like using Farquaad as uh, an adjective. 
I remember at the time being a pretentious 15 year old having and seeing Shrek being like, well, Lithgow's the standout. You know, like yeah. like coming out of that being like, well, He's, he was really funny. It's, it's that was the sly most, humor. It's a sly humor. <laughs> He's got a razor sharp wit. Yes. He was like Taruk the first flight in that. Um, uh, no, Jesus he's, it's, Christ. It's, it's, no, it is. There's a subtle, sly humor, much like Taruk. Uh, he's the most far quaddy performance in that film, no question. But that's that's the run. It's like after Cliffhanger, like a couple other movies, then he gets on Third Rock from the Sun, and he yeah. does like six seasons, and he wins like five Emmys. He won, how many Emmys did he win? Uh, he won, well, now I need to find out. I feel like for years, it was just either Kelsey or Lithgow, and they were like swapping. They were playing badminton together. It is truly wild as a former Emmys nerd, not as much as the other, but like in the 90s, like the 90s, obviously, like sitcoms aplenty, right? Yeah. You know, Friends, Seinfeld, like all the yeah. legendary sitcoms. And it's like, you look at the Emmys, and like every year they were just like... Frasier does deserve a fifth Emmy though. Like, <laughs> could, could we maybe? And like, I love yeah. Frasier. Like, it's not like, but like, Frasier was the weird sort of like awardsy sitcom among sure. the, like critical and commercial favorites. It was sort yeah. of in the middle. He won one, two, three, four Emmys. I, oh no, no, I'm sorry, damn. three, three Emmys for Third Rock, one for Amazing Stories, and then of oh, course okay. he won. Uh, subsequent Emmy for Dexter and another one for The Crown. So he Jeez. has six Emmys. I remember, uh, do you remember there was the one season, if even that, uh, Tambor, Lithgow, CBS sitcom? It was called like A Few Good Years or something like that. Like it's like two old friends enjoying retirement. Yes, I, I'm trying to, I want to remember the exact, uh, yeah, 20 good years, where it's basically good. like, I think they're 65 or whatever. And they like, yeah. the pilot episode is them being like, look, we probably at max have 20 more years. I just remember at the Emmys that year, Lithgow and uh, Tambor presented together and Lithgow went, I'm so uh, thrilled to be here at the first Emmy ceremony in eight years. And Tambor says, what do you mean? And he went, well, it's been eight years since the last Emmy ceremony because that's when Third Rock from the Sun ended. And he goes, they've been doing it all the time since Third Rock ended. And Lithgow in amazing delivery says, well, then who have they been giving the awards to? Good shit. Good shit, but also he won fucking three times for Third Rock from the Sun in the midst of Kelsey Grammer's reign of terror. He still leaked out three wins. I also love that oh, for boy. so long, the Emmy for comedy would go to whoever best played a sort of erudite snob with a mid-Atlantic accent. Like it was like Larroquette, give him yes. all the right. Emmys we yes. got. Yeah. Kramer, like, right. Lithgow. Larroquette had to like issue a Sherman-esque <laughs> statement where he's like, no more Emmys. Yes. Like I withdraw. Lithgow. Like, I the, yes. L Larroquette <laughs> is the only man to retire from winning awards. I believe Candace choice. Bergen as well. Ber Buckets Bergen, LeBron, Buckets, Buckets Bergen. Bergen. Yeah, because I think she won either four in a row for Murphy Brown, something like that. And she finally was like, enough. I like stop nominating me. I I'm don't so have any more room on my shelf. Like, please stop. She won. She she won five Emmys in seven years for Murphy. Jesus. Brown. Wait, David, you're telling me that Candace, Florence, LeBron, Pugh, Bergen <laughs> uh -huh. pulled herself out of Emmy consideration yeah. because she got too many buckets. Yeah. Wow. wow. That'd be like LeBron winning 10 rings and being like, guys, I'm not even going to, I'm going to take a year. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm sailing around the world in a weird, you know, sailboat. Like, I, I, that, this is no fun anymore. But as you said, like then uh, Lithgow, I, I think he's done consistently good work, but it is weirdly all over the place because you go like, oh, it's like, it's far quad. Then it's like. Uh, Orange County, Blake Edwards in the Peter Sellers yes. HBO movie. He plays Kinsey's dad. Uh, yeah, cameo plays, in Dreamgirls. Yeah, he's, uh, you know, it, 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 he often would play like a guy in bow tie and suspenders, sort of right. riffing on 30, Third Rock. But then like... R Rise of Plant the Apes, he's incredibly good in playing he's, he's James good. Franco's that's, uh, that's dementia-laden like, father. Right, that's like his interstellar zone yes. now, where he's like, he's a, the grandpa, yeah. he's maybe going to die in the course of the movie. He's Real maybe sense got of some, sadness, yes. a real yeah. brokenness. And he's good at that. Him. Yes, yes. Uh, he's really good in Rise, he's really good in Interstellar, he's mm -hmm. good in like, he's really good in Love is Strange, 
uh, the Beatrice Irish at dinner. Movie. He's amazing in. Oh, he's in Leap Year um, for like five whole seconds. He's the one who tells her about the Leap Year, right? Yeah, he's her dad who like gambled away like their life savings or whatever, and he meets her in a bar. And he's like, "Oh, you gotta live a little," and she's like, "I'm Amy Adams, and I'm very uptight." Mm. He, pl- he plays one of the Koch brothers in the campaign. Yeah, he's had a lot going on recently because he was in like he's in The Accountant, he's in Miss yeah. Sloan, he's in Late Night, he's in A Pitch Perfect, the number three for some well, reason. Well, of course he well, plays, he's in the group. He plays, I'm sorry, he plays Fergus Hobart in Pitch Perfect great, Three. How do you not great remember character. that? Fergus what Hobart. A name. I thought he was bad in Pet Cemetery, which in the most crucial oh, role. That sucks. I didn't see it. I, I, he's not like terrible, terrible, but like I feel like that role is very specific and he's a little too patrician for it. Like that's supposed to be like a real Mainer yes. armor type guy. Yeah. And he's doing the same thing that he did in like Interstellar and Rise, but it's okay. just, I, I didn't love it. And then I thought he was terrible in Bombshell. Are you going to disagree with me? I mean, I, I'm not going to strongly defend any element of that movie. I don't think he's terrible in it, but it's like, it's a big performance. He's swimming in the river of ham. He's doing the backstroke. He's doing the butterfly. He he is, I would agree with that. But at the same time, he's also not as hammy or as compelling as Russell Crowe was the same year. Well, I haven't seen that. Crowe had a better balance on how insane to be. Because obviously you're playing a deeply insane person. Uh, hey, you're Roger saying Russell Crowe? Oh, Roger Ailes, yes. You know, like that, that like it's like that, you know, it's a tough one to go over the top with because like he is over like that. Of course he is. He's he, like he's a grand guignol human. And yeah, if you just yeah. it's like you know, imagine like I told you, like, you know what one of the people most responsible for the ills of modern society is this guy who founded Fox News. I'm like, what does he look like? And they're like this. I'm like, you made that. He doesn't look like that. Are I you mean, kidding me? He looks like he the looks bully like, farmer. He looks yeah, like exactly. the bully farmer. Yeah. He looks like a freaking like roll doll twit villain, like, you know, <laughs> who's gonna like grind children into paste. Oh god. And, and he's like, like, and, like eating constantly. And I'm like, okay, but he was just like, he was just bad because of his politics, right? They're like, no, 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 no. There was a like evil consumed him. Yeah. No, he'd make women show him his their panties and then lick his fingers and eat a donut while it was happening. Like everything about him is just so overcranked in its awfulness. Yes. Um, so anyway, so yeah, you're right. Like kind of find hard to find, you know, where where to hit the right. target there. But I, he wasn't I, very good in that. I don't. Think he is can, good in yeah. like Dexter. Like Dexter is the one where it's like they're like, give us De Palma again. Give us like sure. a big, goofy villain. Yeah, I mean, look, the guy's got a pretty incredible career in a lot of ways, yeah. and this is a big sort of turning point for him. Despite the fact that this is coming in between Oscar nominations, this is showing a, a very. I mean, first of all, this is the first time that he's really playing a leading man, even if it's in a short film. Uh, yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah, for a guy who did a lot of character actor parts and a lot of villain parts, he did yeah, have no, right. a surprising amount of leading man roles, and this is the first time that he is the center of a film. Yeah, And I think it in its own way, even though this doesn't follow a model of what he ever did as a leading man, shows that he can hold your attention at the center of the frame. A hundred percent. But yeah, and also it also just like even it's those guys, like, even young Lithgow looked like that. He's a very specific. He's very tall. Yeah, yes. He has the the you know the hair like this male pattern baldness. Like he's always had that. Well, it was just he's his hairline looked- was always at the middle of his skull. Yeah, he's always had yeah. that like preppy Frankenstein kind of yes. look. Right? Preppy yeah, Frankenstein yeah. is perfect. It's <laughs> yeah. why, I mean, look, it's why putting him in Daddy's Home 2 is really funny. Right. The trailer for Daddy's Home 2 is really successful as a piece of filmmaking just because the reveal of Lithgow on the escalator is is a pretty like close to a slam dunk. I have not yeah. watched that movie. No. I mean, I the refuse. thing with me is I because I watched Daddy's Home or I tried to after like Sophia Coppola was like, yeah. I mean, a masterpiece, right? Like and, people sort of started yes. speaking up for it. And yeah. like 10 minutes in, I was like, I got to turn this shit off. It blows. No, it gets good. <laughs> <laughs> the first one gets good. Thomas Hayden Church is really fucking good in it. The, the first 10 minutes was just so much of like Farrell being like, a, you know, a dweeb and Wahlberg being a bad boy. And I'm just like, I get it. Like, this is yeah. boring. Ugh. Like the fun of other guys is how quickly they start messing with those dynamics. Yes, I agree. Uh, other guys is a better film. Oh, cool. There's a thunderstorm going on right now. Oh, my yes, God. There's a severe thunderstorm. 
Uh, well, that might pick up in the background of our audio, and it will make this feel even more like a Twilight Zone installment. So let's well, get back hey, I mean, on. To... I just heard that like a minute later after you guys. That's so wild. Yep, pretty scary. I mean, this takes place in the middle of a thunderstorm. I mean, in terms of uh, plotting, there's not much. He sees the thing. Yeah. Uh, the but the stuff I find most compelling is just him looking out the window every time. Like, yes. first him just yeah. gazing at it, then him, like, shutting it and trying to ignore it, and then po- peeking back up. Like, yeah. all, just the way Miller, like, doles it out is so perfect. When he's, like, inching towards it with his fingers, yeah. it's oh. like, you know it's going to be bad and it's it's so enticing this is another thing i love about it is um when it goes from him freaking out in the bathroom to the flight attendants he goes back to his seat they try to talk him down he's largely nonverbal. she gives him the sedatives i was like oh this is going to be their twist on it the flight attendant sits down with him and she right. serves the function of his wife in the original thing, except it's a yep. stranger. It's not someone who she's knows him, him. But that's the person who he's bouncing off of, who he's talking to, who's trying to counsel him, who he ultimately has to like go around in order to stop the gremlin. And mm-hmm. instead, she gives him the set of, and she walks away. And then it becomes about, for me, that feeling when you're having a panic attack and any degree of stimuli is so overwhelming. Yeah. That yeah. the girl is sitting in front of him with the Polaroid camera, mm-hmm. the sort of like gluttonous air marshal, the stewardess is going up and down the aisle, everyone speaking, everyone making any small amount of sound, all of it is triggering to him. Right. Which is great that it's just like, we're not gonna have this guy really speak to anyone, we're not gonna have him explain himself, we're just gonna put you in this guy's head. Like it's like fucking repulsion. It's like using this really, really overcranked filmmaking to make you feel the amount of terror and paranoia he feels so that anything happening on screen becomes some sort of breaking point. And we will cover him in a bucket of water. All the water. All He's the water. He's sweating. But yes, it, it, this does become like a film of, uh, of looks, it's it's really about yep. Uh, yep. you know it's it's in that repulsion that uh, rear window kind of zone of just uh, putting you in a, a single character's headspace as much as possible and showing you how terrifying everything looks to them. Yeah, um, and and it's trying to sort of get you to the place where he thinks the only thing I can do is shoot a gun out the window. Like right, that's my only re- recourse, even though. Like initially he's like, I'm crazy. I'm making it up. There's no way that like he's talked down and then he, you know, then things escalate. But I love that he never behaves in a way that seems heroic, even if he is doing the heroic thing. Unlike um, Shatner, who becomes a little bit more of a like conventional sort of like matinee hero as he's shooting at the gremlin, even if the other passengers don't see it. Uh, Lithgow just right. gets crazier and crazier yes. as this thing goes on. Mm-hmm. He's totally manic at that point. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and um, yeah. down to Miller doing, giving uh, him the uh, toe cutter Joe eyeball shot. Yes, which rules. Um, un fucking believable. <sighs> and then, and when he shoots at the thing, the 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 uh, the gremlin pulls a matumbo. It goes like, uh, uh, uh. yes. But also, his, gives him a he's, little slimy face. he's sticking yeah. his head fully out the window at that point, and his face is freezing over from the air temperature. Yeah. It's great. I mean, he just becomes more and more monstrous as it goes on. Um, I love everything about this. I mean, it's hard to talk about because it is so purely a, yeah, a, no, a visual uh, kinetic exercise. Uh, right, exactly. And it's, you know, 20 minutes. It's just in and out. And uh, it's incredibly compelling. In the original, do they show the rest of the plane being affected by like the window opening? Because that was my favorite part. Is just yeah. like the second he shoots right. the, the window the, the cabin is breach. the cabin goes totally insane, and then you see everyone you've seen throughout just like flying all over the place. The like yeah. unattentive in, mom is holding on to her he annoying opens kid. A door, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. And it's it's certainly, it's less insane. And in the original, they're not building up the rest of the passengers as characters in the same mm-hmm. way. Yes, right. This has the kid. I mean, they're all little, Very they're cute little kid. George Miller right. stock characters. Right. 
But I love that you keep on going back to them and getting their opinions and perspectives on things, that they're like this Greek chorus of doubt. Um, and all of them are sort of such heightened, grotesque characters in their own way. Yeah. The air marshal in particular is like feels like something out of Mad Max. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. He's kind of, yeah, he's kind of gross. Kind of gross. Um, um, but then there's yeah. this beautiful thing when the plane lands. I mean, it's textually the same as the ending of the Twilight Zone short, but um, you have this amazing one that starts with Lithgow being like, see, I was right, I was right, I stopped it, I saved everybody, um, that then pulls back to reveal that he is uh, strapped to a gurney being wheeled off to uh, a sanitarium, yeah. um, that he looks like a ranting mave man, madman, a raving madman is what I meant to say. And then the camera keeps on pulling back and pulling back, and you get the conversation between all the people who are on the planes, the flight attendants, the air marshal, the everybody, the pilot, all yeah. talking about how crazy he was, um, making it seem like uh, the terror was for them. They were also in a Twilight Zone episode, but the Twilight Zone episode was, what if you were stuck on a plane with a madman who shoots out the window? Which is an equally scary thing to imagine. Yeah, definitely uh, not my cup of tea. No. Um, but then it keeps on pulling back and pulling back and pulling back until you get to um, the guys on the ground inspecting the wing of the plane yeah. and noticing what's wrong. And that's when you get the first cut in like a minute. And it's yeah. such a good one because it's not for show. It's not like a fucking like look at me magic trick. It's about sustaining the tension of the unease of all of these people misreading the situation with no cut, with no cut, with no cut, the more all of these characters are telling us that Lithgow was crazy and by association making us feel crazy for knowing that Lithgow was right until you finally get the one break intention, which is the guy validating that there was in fact something right. wrong with the plane. And it looks so goddamn gnarly. You see the wing yeah. and it is so busted up. It's so unnatural. And then you get the epilogue, which ties into the prologue of the film, which is good. It's Aykroyd and uh, Albert Brooks uh, driving in a truck uh, and uh, listening to Midnight, Midnight Special. Um, and I realized watching this, Dan Aykroyd was kind of the Bill Hader of his time. And that yeah. he was like comedian, SNL comedian cast nerd. member, yeah. nerd, who all yeah. like the film nerds love to use. Whether it's a small part or a big part, they're just like, this guy is one of us. We'll throw him in there. He's a movie yeah. star, but also he'll do two lines in our thing. This is what? This is the year before Ghostbusters? Yeah, the year before. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and Brooks was also sort of in that zone. And the prologue is the two of them driving around. It's, re it's really fucking good. It's them, like, in total mm -hmm. pitch darkness. It is what is my scariest scenario, David. The way you, you view a plane, uh, me being stuck in a truck at night when you can't see anything and it's deathly silent scares the shit out of me. And there's just a really long, slow build. I mean, they really yeah. take their time mm -hmm. teasing it out, which is just the radio goes down, the tape gets busted, they don't have any music to listen to, they want to entertain each other, they start singing theme songs, then they do the Twilight Zone theme, then they start talking about their favorite Twilight Zone episodes, um, and then it ends with Ackroyd saying, do you want to see something really scary? He makes Albert Brooks pull over to the side of the road and then reveals the, his large Marge face and uh, seemingly eats Albert Brooks. Uh, and then transitions into Burgess Meredith doing the narration. But the, the only reason I bring narration. this up is because uh, at the end of this segment, and I believe this part was directed by George Miller as well, and not by Landis. Really? The, in in the uh, Landis is credited. Really? Epilogue, okay. Yeah. Even scarier. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. He did the okay. first the first segment epilogue prologue. Well, then I'm sorry. Uh, I was wrong, and for that I am eternally. Ashamed. It's quite uh, right. Um, yes. It's not. It's not. And people are going to call for my head once this episode comes out. But um, uh, yes, the end segment is that Lithgow is uh, in the ambulance being driven to a mental institution and screaming and Ackward twins are, turns around. He's the ambulance driver. And he, he says, you want to see something scary. And then that's the end of the movie. Uh, it does feel like a bit of a step down from the, the Miller of it all. It's a little bit of a deflation, um, even if it, you know, bookends the thing nicely. Anyway, George Miller, though. 
George Miller, though. Yeah, I mean, it's like this is his first time uh, working outside of Australia, working within a studio system, but within a very controlled environment because it's Spielberg essentially passing him a check and saying, just do a little 20 minute thing. Um, and that's what gets him sort of in with Warner Brothers, which leads to him doing Witches of Eastwick, which then leads to him never uh, making an American studio film again without him having the keys to the kingdom, without him ultimately being the person steering the ship. He will work with American distributors, but he will always sort of get his own financing uh, as much as he can, work within uh, But also, like, it's like, you know, he can do their shit better than them. Like, it's just yeah. like, you know, give that guy 20 minutes and a few million bucks and he'll, totally. you know, he'll thrill you. Yeah. No, it's it's just kind of incredible. Like, you know, you have Landis and Spielberg. Uh, uh, Spielberg continues a good run. Uh, Landis drives his entire life off a cliff. And then this sort of like transitions George Miller out of Mad Max and into, you know, the beyond of what everything else he can do. And Joe Dante, it, it kickstarts his career in a major way, uh, which really happens via the continuing apprenticeship uh, and support of Spielberg. Um, but um, we'll talk about wanna... those segments another time. You want to do the box office game? Oh, oh, yeah, actually, let's do the box office game. But also we should rank our Millers, shouldn't we? Yeah. But let's do box office game um, first while I right, solidify let's... my Miller ranking. <laughs> All right. So Twilight Zone the movie came yeah. out 1983. It came out on July, uh, June 24th. Mm. It opened a disappointing fourth at the box office. This was, it only cost $10 million and Warner Brothers was very confident. Like this would be a big hit for us, but also this can be an ongoing series. Like we can do yeah. every couple of years, have a couple superstar directors, make it for cheap. It only costs 10 mil. We can, this, they thought it was going to perform like a Spielberg movie. Right. And at the um, end of the day, it, it didn't hurt anyone. It made $30 million, but it was, it was quickly like, ah, now forget it, forget it, forget it. And uh, the movie had some negative associations with it. So uh, let's oh, talk about it. Oh, no, wait, what was something that? Anyway, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's also, I, I also feel like every Twilight Zone revival basically just never took hold. I know. Hold, I was right? so you know, sure like... the Jordan Peele one was going to work, and it's not bad, but it just doesn't. Nothing ever comes close to the original series. Wasn't that also uh, only on like CBS All Access? Like it never aired yeah, on TV. Yeah, that was an yeah. issue. Yeah. America's yeah. favorite platform, and I do pay for it. I love yeah. it. I love that Star Trek. All right, number one at the box office, the most successful film of 1983. Uh, it's the it's a sequel. It's uh, we've talked about it many times, but it hasn't gotten its own episode. It just comes up a lot. Oh no, it's had its own episode. And the film is called Return of the Jedi. That's right. Uh, okay. Which in its fifth weekend is still number one. It's made 141 million dollars. Oh, it's head. very good. It has Ewoks in it. I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, there's this character called Wicket, and he has a furry little butt. <laughs> Got a furry little butt. <laughs> and that's what's important about that movie. It's the big okay. takeaway. Yeah. All agree. right, number two is another third entry in a franchise. Is it the um, final? No, there are many more to come. Many, there's another direct sequel to come with another efforts at reboots and so on. Um, this was, at the time, re regarded as a big flop and is still pretty... I mean, this movie is hilariously bad, but in a way that's sort of compelling. Interesting. It's a hilarious, ba hilariously bad third film. Is it Superman 3? That's right. Okay. Where they were like, you know what Superman needs? You know, how do we top this? We have Richard Pryor be the second lead. And, and it was also one of those guy. things where, like, they he was on Johnny Carson, and Johnny was like, so, uh, Richard, what kind of movies do you like there? And he was like, I like those Superman movies. And the next day, someone ran to the studio, and they were like, he likes those Superman movies. Let's make a Superman movie almost as much about him as Superman. Um, that, that's fine. Do you know oh, they wait, almost I'm... did that with Eddie Murphy in Star Trek Four? Yes, of course, of course. There's a, a role in Star Trek Four that was that is supposed to be Eddie Murphy, and at one point was going to be ostensibly a co lead of the film. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, hundred yeah. percent. And it, they they junked that the role, I believe, as a woman, and yeah. you know, was completely over overhauled. And that movie yeah. actually rules. Didn't need Eddie Murphy. Uh, be interesting to see it with him though. Number three is another sequel to a huge uh, surprise hit of a 1981 comedy. It's it's a first sequel, the original? Yes, it's a two. It's a two. And it's not European Vacation? No. Mm. It is a comedy. It is a comedy. 
Is it uh, like an SNL National Lampoon adjacent comedy? No, it's outside. No, of much that. worse, much junkier. Much junkier. Is it Porky's too? That's right. And what's okay. the subtitle? The next day. That's right. Here's the I tag do like that if, as a subtitle. Yeah. It's a decent subtitle. Yeah. If you thought the night before was funny, wait till you see the next day. Yeah. And people uh, walked out of the theater saying, I think the night before was funnier. Uh, um, also, just weird because it's called Porky's 2. I believe Porky is not involved. No. But I've never seen any of them. I've seen all of them because they used to play on British TV constantly. They're terrible. But he returns for Porky's I'm sorry, Revenge, I'm sorry, which I'm is sorry, truly bad. Oh, for fuck's sake. David, you saw them all the time on vacation? Yeah, like oh, what they were playing Jesus. like on an endless loop. Yeah, it was and on why a European you going, vacation. Why weren't you going outdoors? You were spending all your time inside at a hotel room watching telly? Watching the telly? Yeah, I was watching the telly. I lived in Britain from 95 oh to 08. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right. Number four was Twilight watching Zone. Mr. Number Bean. five. Number five was a film we've talked about. I did watch Mr. Bean. Um, Mr. Bean rules. Uh, a, another comedy from a director we have extensively discussed. Uh, extensively me. or ostensibly? Extensively. It's a comedy in 1983. Is it Terms of Endearment? No, comedy, real comedy. Real comedy. Like, funny. A movie I adore. It's so funny. It's Some parts so don't hold up. Funny? Yeah, there's there's one scene in particular that does not hold up. Yeah. There's one, like, really bad scene. Yes. I mean, it's just, you're just sort of like, in the moment, I don't know why this was a move, but now this is fucking demented. <laughs> <laughs> like... Well, it sounds like you're describing the ghost blowjob in Ghostbusters, but that's the following year. That's true. Year. That's true. 1983. One scene that's particularly egregious. We talked hit, about this movie. Funny. We talked about this movie in this episode, and we talked about this director a lot. It's a Landis movie. Yeah. As is, it's not Trading Places, or it is. It is Trading Places. So you're talking and about the blackface scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I I love Trading Places. I think it's so funny. I also think it's just a beautifully written movie. It's like you know, it's very concise. Eddie it's Murphy's very, like, fantastic. Murphy yeah. is absolutely insane in it. Jamie Lee Curtis is amazing. That one scene, you're just like, whose idea was this? It's I also think not it was Eddie Murphy's scene. idea, it goes but on it's for still, a while. It's right? like the you're last like, like 15 minutes of the movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, anyway. I'm I'm more of a Coming to America fan. I I think that film's beautiful. I love Coming to America, but I think I think. Train place is a little better, but I don't know. I, I do like them both, obviously. Look, we can um, agree on one thing: John Landis has never done anything wrong. Uh, oh, what else is in right. the top ten? You got Octopussy. Mm. Uh, a truly, a, tr- a truly bizarre movie. Uh, you got never War seen Games, a, more. a great one. War Games. I had forgotten until I was doing my uh, deep dive uh, Twitter stumping. Uh, Martin Brest was hired to direct War Games and directed the first week of the film and was fired. Huh. Okay. Because they thought by Batum? John Borman. Batum, Batum, Batum. Batum, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they thought his take was too serious. That's weird. That movie is very serious. Yeah, but in, his. In a fun way. His weird battle. Well, that's the thing. I think it started out a lot goofier. He made right. it more serious. He filmed a week. They thought it was too serious. They hired Batum, but it still really was the film that he developed. Um, right. And he was the one who fought so hard for Broderick, and it made Broderick a star. There's also Flashdance and Psycho 2, one of the weirdest horror sequels ever. What a weird week. What's what's the gap between Psycho and Psycho 2? I believe it's 23 years. It was for a while the longest gap between a first and a second, right? Yeah, right. I mean, then, like, it's so long that they can plausibly be like, he's out of prison. <laughs> like, right. it's been over 20 years. Yeah, more sequels <laughs> should wait that long. Right. I think Tron Legacy ends up being the longest. Yeah, that one's that one's uh, twenty six or twenty seven years. That's a long one. Yeah. All right. Here's my actually. You you do yours first. I always have to go first. Okay. Oh, fine. Um. Okay. I'm intrigued. I just want want to see how it goes the other way. Uh. So did did not include this in the ranking, right? We're doing no, the nine no, features. No. We're doing nine. We're doing nine. Okay. And it's tough to make the nine. And let's also say, uh, this is a guy. Like many directors we've covered recently, you look at it and you go, "God, that's a good filmography." If this is your I- ninth best film your worst film then you you're a good fucking director there is only one movie that i do not basically like a lot in agrees nine and i think it's probably the same for both of us yeah. and it's a movie yeah. that a lot of people like and i, I do not hold it against them it's just it sure. doesn't work for right. me here's right. my ranking right. number okay. one 
Mad Max Fury Road. Number two, The Road Warrior. Mad Number Max three, J- Lorenzo's Oil. Yeah. Number four, Babe Pig in the City. He's in that city. Number five, Happy Feet 2, a surprise masterpiece. Wow. wow. It has only grown on me. I ordered sure. the 3D Blue. I'm ready to watch it in another dimension. I now have double dipped on Happy Feet 2. Number six, Mad Max. Mm-hmm. Number seven, Witches of Eastwick. Number uh-huh. eight, Beyond Thunderdome. Number nine, Happy Feet. We have very similar rankings, but a little different, so let me okay. give you mine. All yeah. right, number one, Fury Road. It's kind of just inarguable, right? I mean, you're just like, how does someone... Th- what a towering, yeah. undeniable achievement. I think so. I think yeah. so. And the culmination of a career. Number two, Babe Pig in the City. Wow. wow. Number three, wow. The Road Warrior. Wow. Wow. Number wow. four, Give Me That Oil. Yeah. Slide some oil f- to you. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to marinate. In the words of Nipsey Russell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> number five you want to lubricate your mind yeah okay which is a beast wick mm-hmm. um which the, the, these are all close yeah yeah uh but yeah really i do like the witches of east uh number six mad max mm-hmm. number seven happy feet two and you know maybe i'll watch it again and maybe it'll inch up more who knows yeah i think that thing honks <laughs> And then we have the, uh, the the same final two, uh, Thunderdome 8 and Happy Feet 9. But I like Thunderdome a lot and yeah. even Happy yeah, me Feet. Yeah, too. Like, you know, yeah. it's enjoyable. Yeah. Look, I mean, and here's the other thing about the guy, and I feel like we've we've sort of said this in other uh, episodes. A, king of the sequels. Uh, that's, that's I think the thing. undisputed king of the sequels. Yeah, secondly, I mean, my top three for him are all sequels. Secondly, there's an argument to be made that he elevates every genre he chooses to work in. I would agree. Yeah. Like Mad Max elevates action as a genre. Lorenzo's yeah. Oil elevates the like prestige drama. Babe, right. Happy Feet 2 elevate the children's film. Yeah. Like the guy is pretty wild in that sense. Um, and which is Eastwick is just such a bizarre, bizarre film, but was a massive hit. And it makes me uh, wish he would do more of an out and out comedy again, like an adult comedy. His next yeah. film still remains largely a mystery. What's called 10,000 Years of Longing? 100,000 Years of Longing? I believe 10,000. I think, but I do think it's it's more of a drama, but maybe not. 3,000 Years of Longing. That's what it it's called. also sounds like a romance, like yeah, a romantic, romantic drama genie about movie. a genie starring Idris Elba and Tilda Swinton. Right. Here for it. I mean, it, it, like talk about a guy where whatever he thinks I want to see, apparently i want to see if that's what he wants to make then i guess that's the movie i want to see right now is there anything to the rumor about uh the furiosa is it a prequel with anya taylor joy it's now appears to be a prequel that seems to be the vibe this anya taylor Mm -hmm. joy rumor but i mean it's one of those projects that i feel like has been talked about consistently for the last five years and we will wait and see what yeah. actually gets I mean, look, right. Mad Max 4 seemed like a rumor that would never come to fruition for 15 years plus. Uh, and every time you heard a rumor about it, you went like, that can't actually be what they're doing. Um, he did, right after Fury Road came out, say, I got two movies I could make as a sequel. One is about Max and one is about Furiosa. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. All of that makes sense. I, I, I could see that happening. Um, we'll see. I mean, once again, if he wants to make a Furiosa movie, then I want to see a Furiosa movie. If he yep. wants to do a Mad Max sequel without Furiosa, then that's what I want to see. If he never wants to make another Mad Max, then I don't want to see another Mad Max. Like, right. it, it's, it's like the James Cameron Avatar equation. Uh, yeah, you know, I think people have more right. faith in George Miller right now than they do in the Avatar sequels. But I do feel like whatever that guy wants to follow is, I, I will follow him. You trust battle. it. Yeah. 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 And, and, uh, I'm trying to find anything else about 3,000 Years of Longing. It, it seems like they did, they certainly started production this year. Um, I don't know if they finished it. I pray that they did before uh, coronavirus shut down everything. But I feel uh, like yeah. I saw onset photos and that the film at least made it through principal photography. Uh, Am I wrong yeah. about that? Uh, it's listed as pre-production. I don't know. Okay. Well, uh, I hope we get to see it soon. Either me way. Too. Um, but the rumor, yes, was that he was apparently in pre-production on, um, the Furiosa movie. You know, early, early pre-production that it was on the runway. That could be complete bullshit, but that's what was being reported. 
Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, any final thoughts, Davey? Uh, and no, it's been it's been good. Uh, Happy Feet Two is sort of the biggest surprise of the whole thing, but uh, it's been been a good time. Mm-hmm. Not one bummer among them. I'm t- I'm looking here. There's a deadline interview with George Miller from December, where they're talking about uh, the start date for this movie, and I can't find the date. But maybe I, they didn't I, start I, with filming. Miller. I'll oh, believe fuck. it when I see it. I'm just yeah. very believable right. when I see it. Yeah. Okay. Well. That has been our mini-series on the films of George Miller. Coming up next week is Stargate, a Ben's choice. We're going to venture through Al Gore Stargate. Hell yeah. And then the week after that, we're starting our mini-series on Nora Ephron. Nora um, Ephron. So that's Nora Ephron coming up next, followed mm. by our March Madness winner, Bobby Z. Uh, that's Robert right. Zemeckis himself. That and he will give... take us through the end of the year. Yeah, and a little bit into 2021. Um, yep. In terms of what else might be on our calendar, I'm just going to say this now. We don't know because the interruptions we scheduled between now and then were tied to releases of films that yeah. are maybe up in the air now. You know, in theory, yeah. we maybe do a Wonder Woman episode. We maybe do a Tenet episode. We maybe Who do knows? a West Side Story episode. But all those things are big uh, question marks. Um, so if uh, uh, yeah. we do not put up a, an official schedule for these episodes, uh, or it takes a little while, or the schedule changes, uh, don't at Ange. Don't fucking yell at us, because the world yeah. is on fire, and uh, best laid pa- plans of Mice and Man can, can completely go out the window at this point. But uh, right. going through all the Nora Ephrons, including uh, When Harry Met Sally, and then going through all of the Zemeckis's, um, including Welcome to Marwin. Um, but I've had a good time on this Fury Road. It's been weird. Uh, this was overdue. He had been a guy in like this sort of a bag of, you know, immediate contenders for us. He came really close in March Badness twice. We finally settled on him because we thought it would be good to do a more uh, sort of commercial franchisey filmmaker after Demi and a shorter filmography. And little did we know after recording six episodes, uh, the world would turn into the wasteland. Um, it, it has been odd timing. It has been weird listening back to the episodes we recorded eight weeks ago that feel like they were recorded 12 years ago. Uh, it has been weird talking about other movies uh, after the fact. Um, or not after the fact, during our current crisis. Yeah. Um, it's, it's been uh, an odd miniseries, but I think a pleasant journey through these films. And I hope uh, people... Uh, enjoyed watching them or re-watching them. Yeah, for sure. And thank you all for listening. And please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Thanks to Ange Fergudo for co-producing the show and doing our social media. Thanks to Lane Montgomery for our theme song, Joe Bone and Pat Rounds for artwork. Go to blankies.reddit.com for some real nerdy shit. Go to patreon.com backslash blink check for blank check special features uh where we will have covered uh the first babe earlier this month uh, that will only be on patreon because he didn't f- technically direct it and right. uh we'll also be doing a uh, toy story commentaries in which i will behave like a very very <laughs> proper gentleman i will be very yes. very serious and sophisticated and calmly spoken and oh, definitely I'm so excited will not be all horned up. Um, oh, and tune in next week for Stargate. Uh, and as always... <laughs>